Do you know that it's possible to capture the reverb of a real-world space and apply it to any sound you like? It's called convolution reverb, or IR, which means impulse response reverb. In this video I'm going to show you what it is, try to explain how it works, and we're gonna have some fun with it. I'm Anfa, I'm an electronic music producer and sound designer, but I only use open source software and Linux. Let's for starters capture the reverb of this space that I'm in right now, which is a uh, forest. To do this, all I need to do is clap my hands. So often it's a good idea to do this multiple times because, for example, because of all the birds chirping, uh, I'll have to do some cleanup and it's good to have multiple takes so I can clean them up, denoise them individually and composite them into a nice clean impulse response. Let me do it. That should do. Let's now take these recordings and make some reverbs. So now it's two days later and I've got the recording. And unfortunately, not all of it is usable. Actually, very little of it is usable. But I've managed to salvage a few claps, so captures of the space. And here they are. All right, so now I want to make a clean impulse response from that. So I want to make this into a single clap that will sound as clean as possible because there's some background noise. What I'm going to do first is make sure that they are all synchronized. But I will also, before I do that, I will actually normalize all of them. So I'm going to select all my tracks and go effects, normalize. And I will independently normalize them because I want the peaks to be at the same level. All right. Now it's going to be much easier to synchronize them. I'm going to zoom in and I'm going to synchronize to this one. So the first one, I'm going to just use the uh, time shift tool. I'm going to nudge my second clap so it aligns with the first one as closely as I can. So right, we have a peak here. Then we have a throat here. I think I have to move this by one sample and then these throats align. You can see these align perfectly and this follows and it's pretty pretty okay. They're gonna be different. I can't clap my hands the same, exactly the same two times, but they should be close. Now this third one is gonna be is gonna be more difficult because it's it's a weird one. And uh, I, I'm not sure if I'll even find a moment that maybe this, this is okay. You know what? Let's play them all together and listen. Okay, this sounds like a singular clap, so I think we'll, it'll do. Now what we could do is denoise them. <clears throat> and also fade some parts that are not good. There is some bird, bird singing in this recording. I think I'm just going to apply a fade out. Also, we could try maybe noise reduction. So I'm going to go noise reduction, get noise profile. I have selected a piece of this recording, which is silent. And now I'm going to apply this noise reduction effect. Um, I'm going to preview. Okay, yeah, let's get rid of the noise, but... I think this is pretty okay. All right, now I will process the other two claps separately. And now because, you know, denoising is always going to give us a little bit of artifacts, but because I'm denoising them separately, okay, that's, 
there's a bird song in there also. I'm gonna apply noise reduction so get noise profile for this clap. So I'm gonna maybe scroll a little bit, scroll the view a little bit so we just see this one. And I'm going to apply noise reduction and see what. Okay, that's not good. Uh, how about changing the sensitivity? Less reduction. All right, how about zero? Okay, let's do it like that. I'm going to switch it to spectrogram view as well. Uh, yeah, I'm going to also fade this out. So effects, fade out. Okay, now we're fading out. And I'm going to do the same with this. So solo this. And yeah, maybe here. Fade out. Okay, now the third clap. Let's solo it here. Soloing mutes everything else, by the way, temporarily, so we can be sure we're only hearing this, this soloed track. Oh, this one is crazy noisy. Now we have a clean noise sample in here, so let's try it. Let's try and denoise that, noise reduction. Okay, I'm going to just uh, delete all of this and fade it out in here. Now let's listen to our composite clap. There is a little bit of a song of a bird song stuck in there, but I think it's pretty okay. What I'm going to do now is combine all of them. So I'm going to do. First, Control A to select all, and now Tracks, Mix, Mix and Render to New Track. And here is our mix down. What I'm going to do also is uh, select this thing in the middle. I'm going to hit Z to move my selection bounds to the closest zero crossing. And I'm going to delete that. Uh, now I'm going to normalize the whole thing once again. And okay, actually I don't want to delete this part as well. Yep, let me see if I can do this. All right. Yep, that's gonna be our impulse response. So I'm going to export this and bring it into an impulse response plugin and we can listen to what this will produce. All right, so I have loaded a plugin called LSP Impulse Reverb Stereo, which lets me grab my exported IR sample and I'm going to just drag and drop it in here. And you can hear how does it sound like. And now I can make my voice be processed through that. And in order to do this, I need to select in here what I want to do. So input 0 and 1, source, file 1, source, file 1. Ah. Okay. Now I can mute the wet signal. Um. Ah. Oh, actually it is. Actually, it is muted. Okay. Or is it? Yeah. So that's... Ha! Huh. This is me singing in the woods now. The great thing about this plugin, particularly, is that we can also apply some correction to our IR sample, and that is an equalizer. So I just enable it on the file 1 and show it. And here it is. Ha! Huh. So I feel like the low frequencies were a little bit under underrepresented in my hand clap. Ha. Ha. 
ha, 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 ha. And I could also add a little bit of highs. T ha, 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 ha. Okay, now let's move this to the side and we can play with the synthesizer and see what kind of sounds we can create or how does the reverb apply. What we can also do is we can cut the head, which is the ha, ha. and this gives us an effect that we can also apply a fade in. So this really leaves only the tail. <laughs> Sure, it sounds like uh, it sounds like a forest, really. But the very important thing is to cut off the head of the sample, and we can even do more of that, and that will accentuate this little thing. We can also reverse this sample. And what this will happen. What this will do is create reverse reverb. I'm saying things that are being buffered in the memory of the plugin because the convolution reverb is impulse is backwards. The reverb is also backwards. And that is one way to do this effect live, which would be very difficult to do otherwise. You can also cut the head to have we have a really short backwards reverb. A very short backwards reverb. And I can also cut the tail. Cut the tail. Cut the tail. This could create some interesting effects. <laughs> Live. Of course, we have some latency, and you can see that my uh, lips are moving before you can hear the sound. If I clap my hands right here, it also sounds weird. But you can reverse it. Now we just need to um, uncut our head so we can not cut the tail anymore. We can cut the head more. Huh? So you see the initial impulse that is in the five, first five milliseconds, it's what um, gives it the dry characteristics. Interesting stuff. Now I have one more um, forest sample that I've created before, and I recorded it in a different forest. As you can hear, it's a way longer sample. And also there's some noise till the end, so we can fade it out um, right in the plugin. And also we can cut the head. And apply a little bit of a fade in. Oh, that's a bit much. I'm also going to reset this EQ and let's turn it on. I can also make it reverse. reverse. 
That's a pretty cool effect, huh? Okay, I'm having silly fun right now. All right, let's do something a little bit different now. There's a plugin called LSP Profiler. I'm going to load it up. Maybe let's use the mono version because it's a little bit simpler. And uh, what this plugin expects is first to give it the microphone input from our system. So this is the microphone I'm using right here, the Capture One port, and put it output to a system output. And this is a speaker right there. So let's open this plugin now. And this plugin now measures the input levels. Uh, we can calibrate it. So I am going to um, put on headphones as ear protection because this may get loud. Let's enable the calibrator. All right, I think that will be enough. And now what the plugin will do is it's going to play a sine wave sweep from low frequencies to high. And it's going to use that to excite this environment using that speaker, capture the response using this microphone, and it's going to produce an IR or impulse response file for us, which we can then use as a reverb to emulate what would happen if you played a sound in the location of that speaker right here in this exact room and you were listening to it through this microphone. Let's do it. Alrighty, so this is the speaker I was talking about before. The sound is going to come out of it and it's going to go into this microphone and we will get an impulse response from that. So let me, first we need to do the latency measurement, I believe. Oh, now we get a reading. Oh, so the am amplitude was too low. All right, it, it, it has read latency 38 milliseconds. We can now press profile. We can choose the duration of the profiling sign sweep. The longer it is, the higher quality the impulse response will be. Um, but let's go with, uh, well, okay, how long this can be? 50 seconds. Wow. Let's go with uh, 11 seconds and see. And we have an impulse response. Let's check it out, see how it works. How does it sound? Awesome. All right, so I've loaded the impulse response into another plugin called LSP Impulse Responses, Mono, which is like a simpler version of the LSP Impulse Response Reverb. And we can listen to the impulse that it has produced. Yeah, so the result of this sign sweep in here pretty much sounds like me clapping my hands somewhere, but like flatter. And we can also see that it's pretty, like, looks pretty uniform. Let's see if we can cut the tail and maybe see it, it zoomed in a little bit. Oh, yeah. All right, so that's how it looks. Now let's see what happens if I process my voice through it. So I've connected it to my system and put again the same microphone, goes for the LSP impulse responses and goes to the output. I also need to route it to the recording input so it actually gets captured. So now let's do input left. Huh. And now let's do it all wet.
a a a testing all right so it pretty much just sounds like me being far away from the microphone <laughs> but i'm up close uh <laughs> let's switch it up so no wet no wet and all dry so this is how it sounds like this is the real input signal and and this is the processed signal. So it just sounds like me being far away from the microphone, pretty much, which is pretty cool because that means it really captured the sound of this reverb, of the space, of this room with this weird sine sweep. So, yeah. Why the sine sweep? You see, every system, doesn't matter if it's a physical acoustic system, like a room or a musical instrument, or if it's an electronic system that responds to electric uh, currents and impulses, every system has an impulse response. And the term really came from electrical electronics and electrical engineering, I believe, or like signal processing, which is like a broad spectrum. And sound processing is really just a tiny subset of that, I think. And the thing is that... Um, to produce an impulse response, or rather to measure an impulse response, we need to excite a system. So when I clap my hands in a room, I'm exciting the system because I'm emitting a short pulse of energy, which has a wide spectrum of frequencies. There's lower frequencies, there's higher frequencies, and they're more or less evenly spaced. It's not flat. That's why the hand clap is not an ideal thing. Probably popping a balloon would be a better thing because one, it's much louder. Two, it's way easier to reproduce, to make it like repeatable results. You just have a bunch of balloons and you pop them and they should pop the same way. And third, this frequency response is more flat. So uh, what would be the ideal impulse? An ideal impulse to measure a frequency response of, a, of an environment would be infinitely small in time. That means infinitely short or as short as possible, and also would have all the frequencies from the lowest to the highest possible in equal amounts. And something like this exists. It's called a Dirac impulse, and it's what would produce an impulse response file that would change nothing about the input signal. Let me show you. Here's Audacity, and I'm going to quickly create a mono track. And we're going to need some silence. I'm going to generate silence. One second of silence will be enough. Okay, this is one second of silence. If we feed this as an impulse response to our plugin, we will get silence. If we, however, you do this, which is a single audio sample at a value of one, with all other samples being at value of zero, we get a unity impulse response. That means it will change nothing about the input. It will produce exactly mathematically the same result. And of course, to be precise, we should also export only this one sample. Because if I export these two samples, the first one which is zero and the second one which is one, we're going to delay the signal by one sample. Now, what happens if I add a bunch of samples? Like, what will happen now? Now we're coming closer to how convolution actually works. You see, every single pulse we put in here, which is a sample of value 1, is going to, be cr to create another copy of our input signal, only delayed by a given amount. So we're going to have like a very short echo. We're going to have our original signal and then a copy delayed by two dozen samples and then another copy delayed and our two copies side very close together delayed by how many copies and etc. And we're going to have a reverb, a reverb characteristic. If I put more pulses in here and they can be if I, if I make a pulse, which is, you know, 
not a value of 1, which is 100%, but something smaller, like 0 0.1. This is going to just create a copy of the input signal at this point in time, which is going to be 10% of the volume. So it's quieter. So we really can have a reverb tail if we just put points. These are points are just like reflections of the sound when it's bouncing off of distant wall and it takes some time to travel there. Let's do this. Let's create a reverb profile, which is nothing but a bunch of reflections that we draw manually in the impulse response file. Of course, we can also use negative values. Why not? It's only going to produce an inverted copy of our original input signal. Do you know, do you understand what is, this is doing? It's pretty crazy. All right, yeah. I'm not close enough. Let's let's copy this and just create a bunch of pulses. Okay, and we have a 0 0.25 impulse response. Now I'm going to Control T to truncate this. And what I'm also going to do is I'm going to apply a fade out so that the the, the, the first pop samples are pulses are louder and then they're going to be quieter and quieter. Okay, we can also normalize to make sure that our loudest samples are touching zero, or sorry, zero decibels full scale, which means they will be at full loudness. And uh, yeah, we can also remove this first pulse maybe. I'll remove it. Uh, it's not so easy because it doesn't snap. And I can just delete that. And this is our reverb profile. Let's save this, load it into the LSP impulse responses and he listen to what it will do. I'm I'm really curious to see. Okay, first let's listen to what this sample actually sounds like. Hey, it sounds like a bunch of nasty clicks because that's what it is. But now let's feed the microphone input through this thing and listen to what happens. All right, are you ready? I'm turning off dry. I'm turning on wet. One. One. Hello. Hello. Hi. Hi. Hey. hey. Oh, oh, it's quite loud. loud. Hello, person. person. Welcome, Welcome to this place. place. Can, Can you hear me? me? All right, this this is an actually a cool reverb, and uh, we we just draw on it ourselves. What else can we do? Because. Let's check this out on a spectrogram, okay? Maybe we don't have enough resolution. Also, let's view it to 20,000 hertz. All right, and let's view it. Maybe let's have a wider. All right, that's that's too much, I guess. All right, so of course, the, the resolution of this measurement is not perfect, but you can see that the pulses are are extremely wide band. These are the perfect pulses. They cover the whole frequency spectrum. But what would happen if we changed that? If we made them imperfect pulses, okay? So let's go back to the waveform view and I'm going to select maybe these pulses and apply a filter curve to them. I'm going to flatten it, and now let's say I only want low frequencies in here, so I'm going to cut off everything higher. Do you see what happened? The samples got completely rearranged. We don't have a bunch of pulses, we have a long, long wave. But let's switch to the spectrogram and you can see that this is exactly what we wanted. We have energy only on the low end of the spectrum. This is fascinating because this literally demonstrates the duality of sound, which is that it can be expressed in time domain, which is waveforms, but it can also be expressed in frequency domain, which is spectrograms. And it's pretty amazing that, you know, altering something in the frequency domain alters it in the time domain. For example, I can take my pencil tool and I can draw a different wave. 
and we can now see at the spectrogram and see what happened here. I've added a bunch of frequency content. Wow! <laughs> All right! So our impulse response doesn't have to be just boring pulses like this. They can be anything. Okay, let's try and do something else. You see how a low frequency impulse looks like. Let's do a high frequency impulse. I'm gonna grab maybe these and filter them again. Let's go effects, filter curve, let's flatten it. And I'm going to now high pass this. So only high frequencies go through. Look what happened. Can you see this? This is fascinating. I'm going to zoom in. Do you remember how the low frequency stuff looked like? It looked like a wave that like was very tiny, slow and going up. And here it's like something in reverse. It's like we have the wave, the lowest frequencies being like removed. So it's like backwards. It, they are going backwards. This is the rippling in here. And this is called a Gibbs effect. And I can demonstrate to you maybe in some other place, actually. Oh, let's do it here. Our our, um, our signal, our impulse response is just going to be a bit weirder. I'm going to select a bunch of samples and I'm going to normalize them, amplify them. Value not in the range. Okay, let's go negative nine. All right. Okay. Let's now select this whole thing and maybe invert it. Okay, all right. So this is a square wave. Let me zoom, reset the zoom. This here is a square wave, it's a pulse. And in reality, we don't have, like you can think that, oh, it's, it's, a, it's perfectly steep, right? But in reality, it's not. You see, we have these, um, we have these samples and the signal has to go through. And, Actually, the signal isn't perfectly square. It's waving back and forth. And we can see this if we actually low pass this a little bit. So let's imagine we're viewing this at a higher frequency sample rate. And now I'm just cutting off at 20 kilohertz. So this is everything we can actually hear. And you can see that our square wave actually isn't square. It's it has these ripples, and this is called the Gibbs effect. And this is the artifact that you see on artifact. It's not really an artifact, it's just how the wave, how the sound looks like in time domain. When you remove mm, some frequencies and you had like a, so, a vertical thing. So the same thing happens with our pulses, only we're removing low frequencies, not high frequencies. But again, we have a very similar thing. Let's take these ones and do a band pass. So I'm gonna go filter curve, let's flatten it. And I'm going to put a point here and put a point here and maybe let's do a resonance at one kilohertz. All right. And you see that it all just turned into a one kilohertz <laughs> tone. And we don't really have the, we can't really tell if where the pulse is. There was a bunch of pulses you can see and they're, they're just gone. Maybe I'm gonna use a different filter curve and I'm gonna like use a higher frequency. So we have a little bit more like time resolution. All right. So our pulses are so tiny that they pretty much became um, invisible. All right. We have some artifacts like this stuff, but it doesn't matter. Like we're just messing around anyway. Okay, I'm gonna export this and we'll see what does it sound like? You want to listen to how it sounds? Okay, let's hear it. Ouch. That's a nasty sound. All right, let's let's hear how does it sound as a reverb. One. Hello. Welcome. 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 This is really interesting. 
Okay, I really like this sound. It's it's weird. Uh, and you can see we have overemphasized low frequencies a lot. It's very boomy. And I think it's because this thing here is very loud. The amplitude of this thing is really, really high. Let's me let's tone this down by like uh, 12, 20 decibels. Also, let's tone this down by 20 decibels as well. And let's save this out again. All right, this sounds much more high frequency heavy. Let's let's apply this. Okay. Hello, person. Welcome to this place. <laughs> can you hear how similar these sound? We can hear how similar my clap. Like, my clap is an imperfect pulse, a wideband pulse of energy, and excites it so that it sounds like uh, like the sample itself. Pretty fine. Not perfect. We can hear the differences. There's like a, a middle, a higher, no, lower mid frequency buildup in the clap. It's not perfectly uniform, that's what I said. It's not a perfect way to excite an environment. But if it's all you have, it's all you have. All right, so... There's some weird multiplication going on in, in the math, and I think it's it's nice to understand how this convolution works. And you can see we can use that technique to produce some really weird, awkward sounds. Um, and we haven't even tried white noise. Let's do this. Let's do this. I'm going to generate white noise. One second of it, please. All right, so this is perfectly, perfectly white noise. Now, what do you think would happen if I just use this? Let's just try it. <laughs> uh, white noise, one second. Okay. All right. Let's do this. Uh, there's one way to find out, right? Uh -huh. All righty. So here is our reverb sample. Now I'm going to be careful when turning this up because that's crazy loud. One, two, three. Hello, person. Welcome to this place. I'm going to try and cut the tail so we have a very, very short sample of, of noise. All right. Oh, it needs to be under 1,000 milliseconds because the sample. All right. So here is a one millisecond of white noise. Okay. This is how one millisecond of white noise as an impulse response sounds like. Now let's go to two. Two milliseconds of white noise. Okay. We have some weird calming going on. Three, four, and it's getting louder. And it's getting weirder. Hello. And it's like a... This is like... Um, let me turn this down a bit. This is like audio blur. This is like... Uh, like... Yeah, this is... It's like a motion blur. This is like motion blur in audio form. Now... Okay, let's turn this off. We can do some other weird things, like, what if we apply a phaser to this? Um, whatever, man. Just apply it. Oh, I'm going, just going to play the sample. Okay, now you know how it sounds. It's like, like weight noise pushed through a phaser. But what would it do? But what would it do? But what would it do? What it will do to our voice? it up so it's just a bunch of part of this effect and part normal stuff or let's cut the tail all right 
So what the hell is that? What is this? All right, so you can see that this technique of convolution can reproduce various effects. It can um, capture modifying an amplitude of sound in time. Also, the amplitude and frequency, per frequency amplitude of sound in time. What it can't reproduce is uh, things like, you know, pitch shifting. It can't, like, excite one frequency based on another frequency. Uh, it also can't do things like distortion, because that would mean creating frequency content where there was none. So you can't capture, um, like, you know, uh, guitar distortion pedals with impulse response. But you can capture reverbs. And I've also captured a spring reverb in a guitar cabinet some time ago, and I'm going to actually play this to you. And what is f interesting is that convolution is used in guitar emulation plugins to apply cabinet responses. And here is a cabinet response of a guitar. So, <laughs> if you've ever plugged a guitar into an amplifier, you know this sound. This is what happens when you uh, plug the cable into your amp and then plug it into the guitar. You hear a bunch of these pulses. So, what I did is I created this Dirac impulse and I played it through the guitar amplifier. I've also done the same when the reverb was turned all the way up. And this is how it sounds. This is the spring reverb of a guitar amplifier. You can capture a bunch of things with Sway. And you can do really crazy things with sound because you can manipulate this however way you want. Or you can do something weird like record a super weird sound and use this as an impulse response and see what happens. Let's do that. Hello, person. Welcome to this place. All right, that's pretty interesting. You can hear a lot of echoes, and I think it's because when I was squeezing this tissue pack, you can hear... It creates little tiny cracks and pops. And I think, you know, every crack and pop is a wideband impulse which is going to spawn an exact copy, or as exact as, as it can, of course, with modified timing and frequency response, but it's going to spawn a copy or an echo. I think this is pretty mind-blowing, and I think impulse responses are pretty underutilized, and not many people understand how they work and realize how powerful they are in sound design. For example, I, I'm frequently using a sample of a firework going off, a huge firework that I've recorded uh, at a firework show. So that's great because it was the only firework going off in the neighborhood. So I was able to capture this blast without any other noises around. And it just captured the... What a firework does, it's an explosion in the sky. What it does, it creates an impulse of energy that excites all the freaking trees in the diameter of 20 kilometers around or less and the trees respond and the sound is amazing let me play it to you so here is a firework shot i'm i'm using one of the samples let me show you what happens when you load this as impulse response and you can see it's it's stereo so we have left and right, or, or yeah, left and right? I don't know. Uh, the LSP plugin shows us that it has two channels with big differentiating the colors. Now, when I talk, it sounds like thunder. This is the sound of a huge stage. Welcome to the Anfa Sound Festival! How you feeling, Internet? Show us some love! This is a mono plug and we can use a stereo one to hear the full stereo effect. Yeah, so as you can hear, this, this reverb sounds amazing. 
uh, and it gives you this huge, huge stadium or, or, or a huge festival feel. And I'm using that. I'm using this uh, impulse response when I'm making, you know, big explosions. Uh, yeah, trying to give something that hugeness. It's a great way to do it. And um, actually, these I believe these samples are available on Freesound under CC0. I've uploaded these files, so you can download them yourself and play around with them. Uh, yeah. Okay. I think this video is long enough. I hope you've found it useful and interesting, and that you've learn a thing or two and feel inspired to experiment. Yeah, just go crazy. Like, uh, put a, a sound recorder into your washing machine and bang on it. Or, I don't know. Maybe you could use one of these portable Bluetooth speakers to play back a sign sweep for, in a different place and then put it into this LSP profiler to like capture the 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 impulse response in a with, with decent quality because this has a surprisingly good frequency response you know it's not perfect by any means but and you could also like you know play the sign sweep for, to a good microphone and equalize the sign sweep so that you know to how to emphasize some frequencies and de-emphasize others to have as flat of a response as possible i want to do this sometime i don't know how to do that yet but i want to figure it out because then I could capture things like, you know, uh, a storm drain. How does a storm drain sound? I could just put this into the storm drain, put a sound recorder, and capture that. Get an impulse response. And, you know, a, a huge advantage of using the side sweep over a clap is that you can play a sign all through something like this, such a tiny speaker, at a much higher volume than you could play an impulse. So you're going to get a much better signal-to-noise ratio and also you'll be able to capture more of the environment, more detail. I've yet to have to figure out how to use a portable Bluetooth speaker to play a sign sweep in an environment and capture that with a sound recorder. I want to do this. If you manage to do this, let me know. If you find open source tools that can do something like that, let me know. I want to, I want to see that. All right, so this is all for today. Thank you for watching. I hope you've enjoyed it uh, and learned something. If you have any questions or suggestions for future videos, please leave them in the comments. I also would like to say huge thanks to everyone who's supporting me on Patreon and LiberaPay because these people help me dedicate more time to making videos like this and not doing other work. Uh, there's one more thing I want to show you, and that is when we were recording the intro for this video, we've met, we've seen a really amazing tree in the forest, and my wife captured some footage of it, and here it is. So enjoy. I'm gonna go. Bye. Hey, you! What operating system Arch, are you running, Arch, huh? just leave me alone!